All right. Um, so uh, maybe before we get started here, um, just like to take a moment to reflect on uh, the um, the role of both Margaret St. Clair as well as the award uh, that uh, we have the opportunity to host every year through the uh, the Fields Math Ed Forum. Uh, so Margaret St. Clair was an educator who had uh, tremendous influence on many of the folks uh, who are here today um, and. Uh, for the past several years, we've had an opportunity to see um, uh, uh, leaders in, in mathematics education uh, being highlighted uh, in honor of her memory. Um, I know just as a personal story, um, the very first math ed forum, or I think it was the first year that I attended the math ed forum was, uh, uh, I was quite shocked uh, to uh, sort of observe that moment of silence, uh, which was his recognition uh, of, of her passing uh, for Margaret St. Clair. And um, one of the things that really stood out to me uh, and made uh, the Fields Math Ed Forum something that was really worth coming back to was the sense that um, there's a real community uh, that's formed uh, and that comes together here on our, such a regular basis. And through that community, uh, there's an opportunity for discussion. Uh, there's an opportunity for people coming from very different um, vantage points and perspectives to be able to discuss and uh, share what they're doing practically and what they might be doing in terms of research. Uh, and the spirit that I think uh, is exemplified by this award, but but also I think uh, to, to, to a degree, um, what, is, uh, what is done by all the participants in the forum here um, um, is this idea of uh, really that exchange and, and of moving things forward and, and doing things better. Uh, and, then, and I think it was a ser there's a, definitely a feeling of openness um, that's, uh, that's always been there. Um, and I, I think it's also worth noting that um, this year is the first year which marked a bit of a shift in the focus of the award itself. Um, in the past several years, we've had an opportunity to hear um, deeply from folks who've had a long career in mathematics education and to hear how, you know, all of what they've done. Uh, and in many of these cases, for those who've been able to, um, uh, to participate in previous uh, Margaret St. Clair award lectures, uh, there was very much a sense of sort of conclu uh, conclusion of, you know, this, this, is, this is the finality and here's my message, you know, for the next generation. Um, and I think it is worth noting, especially if we look at last year's speaker, um, there was definitely a message of, you know, this is how we're passing the baton um, in terms of faculties of education and, and et cetera. Um, and, it, and this was reflected in the way that the award has evolved uh, in the current year. So we have the, um, the great pleasure uh, of, of hearing from Lauren Didzier uh, today. Um, and what Lauren represents is that um, sort of that new emphasis on uh, early to mid career for folks who are really not putting sort of a, an end an end cap on all that they've done, but really speaking to really in the midst of it, in the middle of it. And um, uh, what we are hoping to do today uh, through the discussions is to uh, uh, find a space that allows Lauren and others who may be in the midst of their careers um, to uh, connect and uh, find maybe even further points of engagement uh, to doing the next big thing uh, that they might be working on. Um, for those who, uh, who are just hearing about Lauren for the first time today, uh, I just would like to take a moment to, uh, uh, to just give a little bit of a background um, on why she was selected for this award. Um, so uh, Lauren, um, uh, has done a lot of work, uh, and, and she's going to speak much more to that work uh, in her talk, uh, around creating spaces uh, for learners. So, of course, uh, Lauren today works at the University of Calgary um, uh, and is, uh, is a professor there. Uh, and, um, of course, that, that carries over into the classroom. Uh, but also, uh, uh, one of the areas that we're going to be focusing a lot on today is the work that's happening outside of the classroom. Um, and um, one of the key uh, 
elements that was highlighted from that work is this, the kinds of spaces that Lauren was able to create uh, for young girls um, who are often not the first group uh, that are um, necessarily emphasized or um, uh, showing as strong participation uh, in the mathematics um, community, uh, at least in terms of uh, general stereotypes, so to speak. So this is something that is worth um, uh, really reflecting on, um, not just in the very unique way uh, that Lauren was able to create those spaces uh, for those learners, uh, but also beyond that and, and the other kinds of spaces uh, that are being created for learners of all kinds. So on that note, I'll pass it over to Kasra Rafi, uh, who is the Dep uh, Interim Deputy Director of the Field Institute, uh, to present the award uh, to Lauren uh, for the 2024 Margaret St. Clair Memorial Award. And I'll also ask uh, Lauren if you could please uh, uh, join as well. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm very honored uh, to receive this award and very honored to be here today and speak with you. Thanks for coming. Um, so I'm Warren. <laughs> um, uh, I'm originally from uh, the East Coast in Cape Breton. Um, this is my dog, Trinity. Um, before I get going, I thought I would just provide a little bit of background so you kind of know where I'm coming from and kind of what lens uh, I'm coming from in terms of what I, what I teach and what I do every day. So um, I'm a teaching stream faculty member at the University of Calgary. Um, and there, I, one of the things I do is coordinate our, one of our very large calculus courses. Um, so that course has about 1,300 students uh, typically, and my lecture section maybe has about 360. So um, that's one of the things that I do there. I also teach second year linear algebra, um, which is a more proof space course. Um, I teach some courses for future teachers. Um, one of them is an appreciation of math course for students that are planning on becoming elementary school teachers, and one is in math inquiry course. So these are kind of the courses that I teach regularly. So kind of like as I talk today, this is maybe the lens that um, I'm coming from. My background um, is in mathematics. I did my PhD at McMaster in algebraic geometry, but I was always very interested in teaching. So that's sort of um, the stream that I went. Um, when I was at Mac, I came to the Math Ed Forum regularly. Um, so I haven't been here in a while because I haven't been in the area, but I'm very happy to be back here today. Um, so I've decided to kind of frame my talk today around this question. Um, so how do we want students to experience and remember our courses? Um, so in particular, we have some content that we have to teach. So if I'm teaching first year calc, the students need to be prepared for second year calc. So uh, calc two. Um, so given that, and given that we have eager young students in our classroom um, sitting in front of us each semester, we have their ears for 150 minutes every week. Um, so that's a pretty big responsibility and potential um, privilege, uh, if we think about it. We, we can kind of shape their experience with us. And they're putting effort or at least some amount of effort into our courses um, during the semester. So um, how do we want to shape that experience? Um, it's kind of one of the questions I want to focus on. And also, what do we want them to take away from our courses? Um, will they take anything away? Is there anything that they're going to remember in 10 years from now that might impact their tenure from now uh, self? Um, how can we make meaningful and positive experiences for our students? Um, so I'm going to share my thoughts surrounding this. I'll share a little bit about what I do in the classroom, but I'll kind of focus um, quite a bit on the outreach things I do as well. But before I get into that, I'm going to give you a moment to think about it in your context. So in your context and the things you teach and the students that you have, how do you want students to experience and remember your courses? Thank you. 
All right, so I'll give kind of an overview of how I want students to experience my courses. Um, so one is I do want them to learn the content at a deep level um, for various reasons. <laughs> but one of them is because I want them to succeed in their next course. Um, but I also want them to have an enjoyable time. And sometimes these things conflict uh, a little bit, or at least not a terrible time. And so it's always a balance between kind of pushing them to you know, learning the content deeply, but also not pushing them too hard that they're not enjoying the experience. Because um, I do want them to be set up for success in their next course. If they're moving on to Calc 2, it's important that they're, they're ready for Calc 2. Um, I also want to reduce barriers, at least the ones that might be in my control, um, to help set them up for success in the course. So I'll share a couple ways that I try to do that. Um, in terms of how do I want students to remember my courses, um, for me, content really isn't everything. Um, do I think that my Calc students are gonna remember all the Calc stuff that they learned in 10 years from now? Probably not. There might be like a little fraction that go on to continue with math and sure they might use it, but are they really gonna remember the content? I don't, I don't think so necessarily. Um, I spent a lot of time thinking about like, how can I help students learn calculus deeply? Like I teach it every year, I'm pouring all this effort into different assessments or things I can do. And so sometimes if I take a step back, it's like, well, if what I'm doing is just to help them succeed in the next course, it feels a little futile. Um, but I don't think that is the only thing that we're doing there. I think that we're using math as a vehicle to develop habits of mind and skills that will stick with them and serve them well as they move through their degrees, but also their careers and their lives. So for me, content really isn't everything. We're using the content to hopefully develop um, some of these skills. So I'll dive a little bit deeper into some of the strategies um, that I use. Uh, for this. Um, so how do I want them to have an enjoyable time in my course, or at least not a terrible time while learning the content deeply? Um, one of the ways I try to do that is through active engagement, both in the classroom and outside the classroom. Um, in terms of in class, some of my strategies for that are using kind of um, learning response system questions. So Top Hat is what we use at U of C because that's what the university pays for. Um, and also just asking big picture overview questions using group work in my class. Um, and outside of class, I think is really where a lot of the learning happens because they're spending a lot more time on my course outside the class than in the class. So I really try to design um, assessments that are kind of frequent and low stakes to help kind of guide them through learning the content at a deep level outside of the course. Um, but like I say, it's always a balance between the two, between setting high expectations um, to push them to succeed and learn the content at a deep level while also hopefully having an enjoyable uh, time. Um, so just a little example of how I might do that in a calculus course. Um, so this is an example of one of my top hat questions that I use um, during one of the first weeks in calculus. This might be hard to read, but it's a, a limit question. It's a zero over zero indeterminate form. And the options say, does this limit not exist? Must it exist or not enough information? So usually I'll have students think about it and vote right away. Um, and here's the initial vote. And you can see that there's um, kind of a split between it does not exist and there's not enough information. So if I saw something like that, I would say, okay, um, there's a split between A and C, um, turn to the person next to you and convince them that you're right. And so in my class of 300 and some students, the classroom erupts, they're, they're talking to each other and then I reopen the poll and have them revote. Um, here you can see a lot of students moved to um, not enough information, um, which was the correct answer, it, it depends. Um, but there's still quite a few students that are saying it definitely doesn't exist, um, which is a common misconception. Um, so why do I spend time to do this activity? Because it obviously would be a lot faster for me to just stand up there and say, if it's this form, this is what happens. Um, one of the reasons that I uh, spend a lot of time doing these types of questions in class is because I can help combat illusions of mastery by helping students identify areas where they need improvement. For my Calc students, I think this is especially important because they've seen Calc in high school. So a lot of them kind of come in pretty confident. Um, uh, and so this kind of maybe points out, oh, there might be areas where, where there's some growth. Um, also, it helps them practice retrieval and strengthen memory. So even if it's a question where they know it and this is easy, it's still valuable because they're at least strength strengthening um, those connections. Um, and also uh, just for those students who still didn't get it after spending um, time on it and talking to their neighbor, it primes their brain for learning. So now I'm gonna talk to them about it. We'll go through it together. And so just in general, when students engage in prediction, even if they're just making a guess and kind of help set the stage for um, paying attention. 
In particular, you create a network of related ideas, setting the stage for learning. And in general, investing emotion can cause you to pay closer attention. Just in general, when we're curious, we learn better. Um, so that's kind of some of my motivation for doing questions like that. Um, how else do I try to help students uh, learn the content deeply but have an enjoyable experience? Another way is by creating assessments that they hopefully find meaningful and where they can showcase your creativity. Um, and I have more freedom to do this in my courses for future teachers where the content isn't, uh, you know, there's not a whole lot of content that we must get through. Um, so I'll share an example from that. Um, this kind of gets to some of the outreach work that I do as well. Um, so first, I guess, why might you want to do it in general? Um, just assessments that promote creativity and highlight relevance in the course content can help boost motivation, um, which in terms promote, promote learning. Um, so this is um, my SNAP Math Fair event uh, that I did um, with my um, appreciation of math course. So like I said before, the majority of students in this course plan on becoming elementary school teachers. They're still in their degree. So they might be English majors, they might be biology majors. There's some math majors in there as well. And the few students who are taking it as an elective, but the future elementary school teachers are the primary audience. Um, and if you haven't heard of a SNAP math fair before, what it is, is it kind of resembles a science fair in appearance and that there's tabletop displays. Um, each tabletop display has an intriguing math-based puzzle for students to engage with. Um, so um, kind of historically, um, these SNAP math fairs would happen in schools, not at university necessarily, where maybe a group of grade five students create the SNAP math fair projects and invite grade four students over to engage in them. Um, but this is a university SNAP math fair where my university students are creating the, the projects and I'm inviting um, elementary school students to come engage. Um, so when I did this, um, I had 100 students in my class. So there were 50 projects and I invited 200 grade four to six students um, from uh, four elementary, Calgary elementary schools to come participate. So they came, of U, they came to USC for like two hours in the morning um, and had a great time. It was really fun. Um, and this is worth 25% of the course grade for my students. Um, they made these projects. They also submitted a final report. So there was some writing involved. Um, and also I did a dress rehearsal with them all so that I could see the, the projects ahead of time because the day of was pretty um, chaotic. Um, so here's a, just a few more pictures um, from that. Our theme was under the sea. So I had my students vote on a theme. Um, and these are all logic-based puzzles. So one of the rules is that there shouldn't be arithmetic or if there is very little. So the idea is that students should be able to engage no matter what their background is. And then um, my students uh, were told they should kind of have hints to kind of bring it down a level and also ways to extend it. Um, so like with this one, you have to move the turtles to one end, the sharks to the other end, but they have different size, um, different sizes uh, to kind of, so students can kind of generalize um, how to do it if for those students who are eager. This one's like a graph uh, theory based one, um, Shark's Quest, which is like Knight's Quest. Um, but yeah, students were very, did an amazing job with, with the design and also um, with the math involved. Um, and like this one is a two player game where like the first player can always win type of thing. So my students would have prepared, you know, hints and stuff to try to get into what the strategy is for those students that want to. A lot of the students are just showing up and playing the game and having fun, but some of the students, if they're interested, um, we can kind of get more into the math uh, a little bit. Um, there I am in the, in the gym, but, but yeah. So this is one way that I tried to kind of, uh, we're kind of learning math and, and, but in a way that's hopefully meaningful to them because my future elementary school students are, you know, engaging with the students that they are want to teach. And also they're, a lot of them appreciated showing their creativity. Um, in the past, I've done presentations where um, students answer the question, how has math impacted the world? And they're encouraged to choose a topic that's meaningful to them. Maybe it's their major, or maybe it's just something they're interested in. Um, with this course, I also always do a financial project, which is really popular. Um, in the course, we learn about like compound interest and how to represent data. So they kind of apply the concepts in this project where they act as financial advisors and they have a bunch of information about Donna and they have to tell Donna how much house she can afford and different mortgage options. Um, and then my TA plays the role of Donna and they present their project to her and she asks them questions about it. Um, and my students have found these pretty meaningful because they're like, I'm probably gonna have to buy a house someday. And like, I can see how I'm, I'm using math um, in the real world. 
Um, some shared that these projects allowed passion and genuine interest to be integrated. Um, and a lot of STEM majors in particular said that um, expressing their talents and creativity um, was missing from their degree. So they, they appreciated the opportunity to, to do that. Okay, um, so how um, else do I wanna make good experiences for students in my courses? Um, another way is uh, to reduce barriers that are within my control. Um, and one of them is reducing cognitive load. Um, so I'll share some little things that I do in that regard. Um, so by cognitive load, I just mean that our working memories can only hold a limited amount of information at one time. And once it reaches this capacity, it can be difficult to process new information. Um, so before I went to uh, UFC, I did a teaching postdoc at the University of Minnesota. Um, and there was kind of like a semester long professional development thing on cognitive load. So some of these ideas are kind of, um, I learned there. Um, but one just really small thing that I do is um, by using transition slides, um, like this, kind of when we get to a new topic in the slides, it just kind of gives in students an invitation to re-engage. If they kind of tuned out, they can kind of tune back in. Um, also just using colors or titles to kind of show where we are in the slides. Um, it's just kind of a little thing, but students have found it very meaningful. I've gotten good feedback, um, especially um, from students with ADHD, have kind of just reached out unsolicited to say, hey, these slides I found very very helpful. Um, so that's one little thing that I do. Um, another kind of barrier that I uh, try to help with um, is helping students develop metacognitive skills and a growth mindset. Um, and I'll share some little things that I do in that regard. Um, by metacognition, what do I mean? Um, so reflecting on your own approaches to learning, accurately assessing what you do and do not know, and modifying your behavior as a result. So this is very important to learning um, and to studying um, so that uh, you know, you're studying the right things and efficiently, but unfortunately it's been shown that many uh, university students are rather weak in these metacognitive processes. So if there's a way that I can help students develop these skills in my courses, especially in my first year course, I would very much like, like to do that. Um, so one way that I try to do this is through reflective prompts. Um, so prompts that allow students to reflect on their current knowledge, confusions and learning processes can help students develop these metacognitive skills. So for example, like, how does this connect with what I already know? What do I find most challenging? What was this question trying to teach me? Um, kind of questions like that. Um, and one study showed that pairing mathematical activities, so maybe like a homework problem that you're gonna assign anyway, with a reflective prompt like this has been shown to significantly enhance academic performance. Um, so kind of taking that homework problem and pairing it with one of these um, can help students um, learn better. Um, in terms of growth mindset as well, I also use reflective prompts, um, but they're kind of more of the form like, um, like what am I doing? So what, now what? So uh, why is it important? What will I do? Um, with this in the future. And often with those, I use them at the end of the course so students can kind of reflect on their growth throughout the course and how far they've come um, with whatever skill we're trying to develop. Um, so that's just a little bit about what I try to do um, in the classroom for that. Um, another barrier though is promoting a sense of belonging. Um, so many of our students might not feel a sense of belonging in a math classroom for various reasons. Um, <laughs> So some just little things that I try to do um, in my classrooms to help students feel more of a sense of belonging is I have them submit an about me discussion post or assignment where they share their preferred name, gender pronouns, you know, a bit about them. Um, this helps me get to know them and helps them know that I care about them as a, a person and also it helps their um, classmates get to know them if it's a discussion post. Um, I also try to facilitate the formation of study groups in my first year courses. This isn't much work for me. I just make a Google doc with tables where students can sign up and then they email each other. Um, but just to kind of um, encourage them to work together, they don't have to go through this calculus course all by themselves. Um, for students who might show up to university and not know anybody, I just kind of, you know, I'm the one at the front of the room and, you know, they might be very shy. So if there's something I can do to help facilitate that, I would like to kind of promote the formation of study groups. And we talk about why working in groups and studying groups um, is helpful for learning. Um, they also provide opportunities throughout the semester for them to engage in, in group work and activities to get to know their peers and try to set classroom norms um, to foster a positive learning community. Um, 
But um, many of our students might not feel a sense of belonging in the math classroom because um, they feel underrepresented. And for me, I show up on the first day of class, there's not much I can do to change what my classroom looks like. I have the students that I have in my classroom and you know, I can't change um, who, who's in the classroom. Um, and so we might ask ourselves then, well, how can we make our classrooms more diverse um, to promote this sense of belonging? Um, and so how can we shape what our future classrooms look like? Um, and this question has kind of motivated some of the outreach work that I do. Um, so the outreach work that I do um, for girls, um, one of my big goals is kind of promote a sense of belonging in the mathematical community um, for our future university students. So these K-12 students will be our university students um, in not so long a time. So if we can change their attitudes about math, maybe in five or 10 years, our classrooms will start to look a, a little different. Um, so I'll share a little bit about the work I've done um, with that. Um, so the first program I created at U of C um, for girls is called Girls Excel in Math. Uh, so this is a Saturday morning program for grades six to eight students who identify as girls. Um, we typically meet twice per semester from nine to 12 in the morning. Um, we start in a big lecture hall um, and I introduce the topic uh, and then they go to smaller classrooms to engage uh, in group work activities with students from their own school, maybe students from other schools, depending on how many the size of our classrooms and how many students came from a particular school. Um, so the way it works is I advertise to the teachers. So I advertise to junior high school teachers and they sign up their school. From my end, this is helpful administratively because I don't have 180 permission forms from 180 parents. I have, you know, eight teachers or whatever, and it's kind of a field trip in terms of the, the paperwork. Um, but it's also good because these teachers know their students. Um, and so, you know, I give them a lot of different worksheets to choose from and they kind of um, have a better sense of maybe what they can handle and what they might be most interested in. I also have a lot of undergraduate volunteers to support as well. These volunteers, um, many of them plan on becoming teachers themselves, um, but there's also a lot of math majors who are just interested in teaching and this type of outreach work. Um, so last time I ran it, so I'm on sabbatical right now um, since January. So the fall 2023 was the last time I ran this. We had 180 students um, from eight Calgary schools participating in GEM. There were 15 junior high volunteers and 13 undergrad volunteers. Um, so it was fun. A lot of students um, coming on Saturday morning uh, to, to do some fun math. Uh, in terms of the topics we do, um, uh, we do things like cryptology, fractals, we've done graph coloring, math card tricks, prisoner's dilemma, voting, Eulerian graphs, origami. Um, so things that they wouldn't normally see in school necessarily. Um, kind of things with like really low floor, high ceiling. So everybody can kind of get going with the, with the topic. I tell teachers, you know, if they spend the whole morning on just one worksheet, that's totally fine. As long as they're having a good time. But I make a lot of uh, worksheets in case, you know, because we have grade six to eight, we have students you know, some students from like a private school and students from like all over Calgary. So um, yeah, that, that's where the teachers really help uh, kind of guide what goes on in the smaller classrooms. Um, and in general, my goal is for students to learn through exploration. Um, so to work together, it's very group work focused. I try to make fun activities for them to engage in. Um, for example, like the math card trick session, they can do the math card trick, they learn it. Um, but then there's a lot of scaffolding and prompts to kind of get into the math, like, will this trick always work? Um, create an argument explaining why this trick works. And so that kind of gets um, to kind of the more math um, involved. Um, and for the students they are like, hey, I just want to kind of do more card tricks. They, they can do that, but they're, um, for the students that are, are really engaged, they, they get into the, the math behind it. Similarly with Prisoner's Dilemma and game theory, a lot of these games, you know, player two can always win. And so they'll be scaffolding to be like, okay, what if we kind of made it a little bit easier? Let's look at a special case. How could the second player always win in this? Um, so that's kind of how I try to set up the activities. Origami is a very popular one, um, but there's a map behind origami. So they do the folds, they have fun. Um, but then we look at, you can kind of two color the folds. Um, we use the origami to talk about platonic solids and their properties. Um, so this is just kind of a flavor um, for the types of things they do. Um, and I spend a lot of time making this because I try to make it as easy for the teachers and the volunteers as possible. They don't have a lot of time. So I really try to, you know, design, I design like a, kind of teacher manual type of thing where they can kind of show up and, and go uh, kind of thing. So, uh, you know, 
I match them with their undergrad volunteer as well. So if the teacher wants an undergrad volunteer to take the lead, they might reach out a week before and kind of coordinate with each other. Some teachers are comfortable just kind of showing up and, and, and going with it, um, but yeah. Um, coding theory, so I'm on sabbatical this semester and I've been making the curriculum because that takes a long time and I don't always have time for it because uh, I do a lot of teaching. Um, so that's what I've been doing the past year. I just made a coding theory one recently. So kind of in the big classroom, I'd introduce the topic. So, we'll, you know, if you go to a website and find a picture, how did your computer know what to show you? Um, I might show some videos to kind of introduce it. Um, and then for them, we might kind of tone it down just so they kind of get the gist of, of how it works. This is too small to read, but this would be like a worksheet that, that they would get. And then the teacher version of it would have kind of all the, the solutions and also tips for teachers. So questions they could ask to kind of extend it or maybe just extra information about the topic if they're interested. Um, so my motivation um, for starting GEM, uh, so I started at UC in 2018. Um, and when I got there, I was very involved in all the outreach stuff that was going on. Um, and I noticed that girls were underrepresented in the Richmond programs we were already doing. Um, so for example, when I showed up, we had a math night, which was a Wednesday problem solving session. Um, and there was typically about nine guys that would usually come in one girl. Um, when I got there, um, I took over our CMS regional math camp. Um, and so I was looking at the past um, reports and I noticed the year before there was like 24 guys, six girls. The year before that, it was 15 guys, six girls. Um, I was involved in our math contest um, and the top scores, it was like 37 guys, 14 girls. So there was definitely like a disparity um, there. And I just thought that, you know, I wanted to create kind of safe spaces for girls where they could have fun doing math. Um, so I know personally, you know, I, I was a junior high school girl, like I liked math, but I probably, to be honest, would not go to math night on Wednesday um, to hang out with like nine guys if I was the only girl there, even if I really liked uh, math. Um, it depends on the girl, of course, but um, kind of with GEM, it's all girls. And because their school, uh, they're going with their school, you're kind of getting a lot of students that might not go to this thing otherwise. So you might, your teacher is promoting it. You might have, you know, your friend is really enthusiastic about it and they kind of maybe drag you along. And the teachers have shared, this is what has happened in some cases, but then these girls that came reluctantly were like, whoa, this is way more fun than I thought it would be. Um, so I think that I'm kind of reaching um, kind of a demographic that wouldn't typically come to, to these types of, of programs. Um, so when I started doing this, I started reading about kind of gender bias in math um, and maybe why we're seeing more guys and girls at these, these programs. I'm by no means an expert on this, but I'll kind of share with you some things that I found interesting um, and the things that I've read about it. Um, so when I say gender bias, that refers to a person receiving different treatment based on the person's real or perceived gender identity. And it's often due to unconscious or implicit bias. So it's not something that people are doing consciously or trying to be any kind of way about it. It's just totally unconscious. Um, and often where we might hear this um, is, you know, when you close your eyes and picture a leader, what do you see? Um, so this is some places where it often comes up in the workplace type of thing. Um, it can lead to negative things like performance support bias. That's like maybe um, a woman, woman uh, receives an inferior sales account when hired and then their sales aren't as good. Um, a way that I've seen this in academia, I, I had a, have a friend who was hired. Um, she was an, she's an engineering professor. She was hired at the same time as uh, her male colleague and her chair gave her um, teaching a lot of second year courses and first year courses because they're like, you're a really good teacher. So like, I'm going to give you these types of courses. Um, but what ended up happening is that because she wasn't teaching the upper division courses, she had a really hard time recruiting grad students, whereas her male colleague had like no trouble recruiting um, graduate students from the upper division classes. And so she really, you know, felt like this impacted her, her research program. Probably not at all a conscious thing <laughs> that her chair was doing, but just sort of something that, that um, you know, negatively impacted her. Um, but in this context, um, with young girls, um, a lot of the, the research papers look at when you close your eyes and picture a mathematician or picture a scientist, what do you see? Um, so with several studies asked students to draw a mathematician or scientist. Um, and in some of these studies, girls were twice as likely to draw men. Boys almost universally drew men. Um, another study looked at how that changes as girls get older. So in this study, 70% of six-year-old girls drew a woman. Um, but 
And when they looked at 16 year old girls, only 25% drew a woman when they were asked to draw a mathematician or a scientist. Um, and why does this matter? Well, stereotypes linking um, science with men um, may make um, you know, women not view themselves as future scientists or mathematicians. Because if they, they picture a scientist and they're picturing a man, then they're not viewing them, their future selves as a future scientist. And so that might impact kind of unconsciously the decisions they make about what they choose to, to focus on. Um, another study, uh, female undergrad students described a mathematician as exceptionally intelligent, obsessed with mathematics and socially inept. So <laughs> if, you don't, if you don't view yourself like that, then maybe like you might think being a mathematician isn't for you. Um, so uh, what else can these types of um, kind of unconscious biases lead to? One, one of them is stereotype threat in students. Um, so in some studies, the perception that women are not as good at math as men, it's been linked to lower academic performance by triggering self-doubt. Um, stereotype and threat in teachers. Um, so female teachers might not um, believe that they're good at math. And if there's female students are viewing them as role models, then they might doubt their own abilities as well. Um, implicit bias in grading. Um, so teachers might unintentionally hold stereotypes about their students' math abilities and grade differently. So in one study, they um, were grading sixth grade math tests. And in one of the conditions, all the names were removed. And so when there were no names, the teachers graded them and the girls ended up doing better. Um, but when they graded them with names, the boys ended up doing better. So having those names on it um, impacted uh, the grading. Um, and this isn't just a male female thing. Um, so it's um, even more pronounced um, in low income black and Latino females um, in these studies. But um, girls do perform just as well on math tests in elementary school and junior high school. Going into high school, it's been shown um, that um, they enroll in upper division math courses at equal rates. But partway through high school, something happens. Fewer girls um, take advanced math and science courses as they get closer uh, to university. Um, and then once they get to university, the sleepy pipeline kind of continues. Um, so in this graph here, 41% um, of undergraduate math majors in 2015 um, in this data um, were female. When you look at PhDs, dropped to 28%, postdocs, 25, tenure-track, uh, tenure 24, full professors, 11. So kind of at each, each rung, um, the number of women dropped out. Um, in this graph here, the green um, looks at women in industry and in computer and mathematical occupations, and it says 26% um, of those in computer and math occupations were women. Um, this data is from the, the US, but in Canada, things don't seem that much better. So on the Government of Canada website, it said that less than 25% of Canadians working in science and technology are women. Um, and of course, um, having more women in the STEM workforce can have a lot of positive benefits. Um, so we might want to, you know, a bit of a motivation for why we might want to change um, what our uh, STEM courses look like. Um, so <laughs> with that in mind, that also kind of uh, motivates what I do. So through these um, activities, I hope to encourage girls to view themselves as part of the mathematical community. So maybe they view themselves as future mathematicians and scientists. Um, I try to do that by exposing girls to female role models. So that can be the undergrads helping to lead the activities, their teachers, but also their peers. Um, so in a lot of the feedback I've collected, you know, when I ask them about female role models, they talk a lot about their, their fellow students um, that are there with them and, and how they, they found them inspiring. Um, I also hope to stimulate girls' interest in math by highlighting applications and just having fun participating in collaborative, non-competitive activities. Um, and expose them to areas of math they wouldn't normally see. So just to kind of illustrate that math is a lot more than just arithmetic uh, and numbers. And with the GEM program, because the teachers participate too, I also hope to kind of uh, expose the teachers to that too if they haven't seen that type of math. And a lot of my GEM teachers take that curriculum back to their classrooms um, to use with, with all their students. Um, so we can kind of help enrich um, their teaching and they can reach a lot more students uh, uh, in their careers than I can. Um, so that was GEM, the first thing I did. Since then, the last couple of years, I've been also been doing some math camps for girls. So I'll speak a little bit about that. Um, so one of them is this overnight camp called Math Attack Summer Camp for Girls. 
Um, this is an eight day overnight camp for 21 grade six to 10 students from across Alberta. So Calgary, Edmonton, Lethbridge, wherever um, we can find them. Um, they spend five nights at U of C and two nights uh, at BERS, so Banff International Research uh, Station. Um, so they have eight days of like doing math, um, but also they're spending all day and night together. So um, they become quite tight during this. Um, I did it um, two years in a row and then I was on sabbatical this summer. So I didn't do it in 2024, but I'll, I plan to, to run the program again when I'm back next summer. Um, and the outcomes are similar. Um, I want students to pursue their passion for math and uh, meet peers who share similar interests. Um, they do similar types of things as with the GEM program, but um, I don't do it all myself. I recruit colleagues of grad students and my, my colleagues um, to help run these things. I've run some of the sessions uh, as well, but in the past we've done things like crypto, data science, probability paradoxes, actuarial science. Um, and I would say that this is a little bit more um, advanced. So because we do have uh, students coming for eight days of doing math and not just three hours on a Saturday, we do wanna make sure that the students, you know, wanna be there and are super excited um, because a lot of students wanna come and we only have 21 spots. So um, I, I'll talk more about, um, you know, how, how that application process works, but that, that's maybe one of the differences um, uh, than the GEM program or is GEM program open to everyone. Um, these programs are also free um, or they have been. GEM, I should be able to keep free. This is very expensive. So it's always like contingent on getting grants and having funding, but I try to keep it as, as close to free as, as possible. Um, in the past, I had a one of my bio colleagues did a modeling zombie outbreak with them. Um, I had a women in math panel where I invited um, four uh, women who work in industry in Calgary who have math backgrounds to talk about how they use math in their jobs. Um, they do fun team things like we did a math amazing race one year. We did a crypto hunt. Um, so these are the types of things we might do. This is the math panel. Um, but yeah, kind of throughout the week, they're exposed to about 20 female role models. Um, their junior chaperones are just graduated high school. So they have some chaperones kind of close to their age, more senior chaperone who maybe just graduated um, from our undergrad and then you know, grad students, professors. Um, and there's lots of time for fun stuff too. <laughs> so we went for a hike, they went swimming, they went to McDonald's. So it's not all math, but it's a lot of math. Um, so the first year that I ran this, we kind of tried to promote it to as many people as possible to try to reach as many people as possible. And we ended up having 150 applications for only 21 spots. Um, and I really didn't want to send like 130 rejection emails to like, grade six to 10 girls who really wanted to come to a math camp. So I decided to make a second camp, um, invite them all to that camp and it was a day camp. So, you know, day camps are less expensive because I don't have to pay for their accommodations and all their food. So I ended up doing that and I invited everybody else to that. And so I called that the Girls of Cell and Math uh, Summer Camp. Um, so the first year I kind of asked all my speakers if they'd mind giving their talk twice. Um, we end up having 99 students that first year that came to the GEM camp. Um, and the second year I ran it, we had 121 uh, students. Um, so yeah, that's fun. It's like a three-day camp. Um, and it's similar to the GEM program, I guess, in kind of kind of level. And it's it's free for, for all students. Um, yeah, but <laughs> these camps are, are definitely like a lot of work. But I do think that, that they're worth it. Um, and I get very positive feedback um, from the students, um, which kind of um, motivates me to to keep, to keep going with it. Um, so like one student in GEM um, said that she's able to discover a new passion for math and make friends um, uh, who shared some more interest. The second student here was kind of skeptical. She said, uh, you know, uh, when I first heard about GEM, I was skeptical, um, but, and I'd always struggled in math and never really enjoyed it, um, but GEM changed that. Uh, so this feedback is like very meaningful because that's kind of the students I'm hoping to reach. Those students who might not think math is for them, but then they kind of see um, how much more to it there is than they might have seen uh, in school. Um, so yeah, that's kind of uh, the outreach things um, that I have done. And maybe during the panel and question period, um, I'm happy to talk more about it. But kind of to, to wrap up, um, I'll talk a little bit about how I want students to remember my courses. So, so far I've talked about the experience and uh, how I want them to experience the course, um, but what do I hope sticks with them? Um, so I'll just give a little bit of a, an overview of that. 
Um, so I want them to develop these skills and habits of mind that will hopefully stick with them. Um, what are one of those? So one of those skills that I hope to instill is a sense of being brave. Uh, so I want students to be comfortable with tackling something hard, failing, um, and then trying something new. Um, and I think that math is an excellent vehicle to help uh, achieve this. Um, I want them to have the confidence that even though I've never seen this before, I know I can do hard things and I can figure it out. Um, I have a, a friend who did an undergrad in math and then a master's in financial math. And now she works in downtown Toronto at a bank. And this is kind of what she said. <laughs> she took from all our math training. I'm like, hey, like, do you use any math and any of the math you learned in your job? And she's like, well, she's like, really what I, what I took from it is like, I did this really hard abstract algebra course and it was really hard for me and I succeeded. And what I'm doing now is not as hard as <laughs> this abstract algebra course. So like, I know I can do that. I know I can do hard things. So for me, by kind of pushing students to kind of learn the content and really get in the weeds, I hope that when they succeed, it helps uh, to instill this perseverance. Um, and so my philosophy is the math we do in our service courses or really all of our courses um, to motivate them to learn the content deeply uh, is in support of this goal. Um, I also want my students to leave the course with positive feelings about math and have more confidence um, in their mathematical ability than they walked in, especially for my future teachers. So in my course for future elementary school teachers, this is like a huge goal for me because I really want them to feel good about math when they go into their classrooms, um, but all my students as well as they move through their STEM degree. Um, so how do I try to achieve that? Um, so one of the ways is by providing lots of opportunities to show growth. So that could be through low stakes assessments where you know, we drop some, uh, you can you know, redo them, doing rewrites. So there's always like constraints, of course, and limited resources. Um, but you know, in an ideal world, this is what I'd love to do. Um, for example, in my second year linear algebra course, I let students have a mulligan um, one mulligan throughout the semester where if they wrote it and they don't want it to be graded, they put it in the do not grade pile and they can write the rewrite next week. I can't have them be doing that with every single test, but that's a small way that I try to do in that course and also dropping lower test scores. Like in our first year Cal course, we have two midterms and a final um, and we drop, they're really three tests. So I guess equally weighted uh, and we'll drop one of them. Um, just for students who are transitioning to from high school to university, I want them to, you know, if they get a low midterm one score, I don't want that to be the end of the world. Honestly, I don't care if they know the material then or by the end of the course, as long as they know it um, by the end. And so if there's ways I can help shape my course to encourage that, I try to. Um, and also just providing opportunities to reflect on growth. Um, so like the reflective prompts I do to kind of encourage growth mindset and uh, perseverance, um, just kind of show you know, I didn't know anything about this now, and now uh, I know it quite well, um, especially for that financial project um, that I mentioned before, where students present the topic to my TA, who plays the role of Donna. Some of them have shared in reflections, like, that was a really meaningful for them, because they knew nothing about mortgages or financial math going into it, and then they heard themselves kind of explaining something they knew nothing about a few weeks ago, really confidently uh, to their TA. And so kind of reflecting on that, they, they felt good about, about what they, they learned in the course. Other skills, um, critical thinking, problem solving, logical argument. Math is great uh, for developing those. There's nothing specific that I do for those skills other than kind of just pushing students to learn the content deeply. Um, but in terms of sort of like, what are we doing? Why is this important? I really think that, um, oops, sorry. Um, even if they don't use the content again, um, by kind of working through it carefully, it can help develop these skills, which I do think um, will serve them well um, moving through their the degrees and their careers. Um, I'm also very passionate about teaching students how to communicate mathematically. And I could have talked the whole hour about that, but <laughs> I'll just mention a little tiny bit um, about why I think that's important. And I'm happy to talk about it more during a break. Um, why might you want to emphasize communication in your course? Um, one of the reasons is that I really think that it helps develop these skills that I just mentioned, such as learning the content at a deep level, emphasizing communication can encourage that, creating logical arguments and critical thinking, confidence and growth mindset, especially through reflective writing, um, and also developing metacognitive skills. 
but also um, emphasizing communication um, can help students cultivate their ability to communicate complex ideas to non-experts, which is also an important skill that we might want students to leave their degree with. Um, in particular, um, the, uh, communicating complex ideas to non-experts is a skill that employers want. So it's been shown that when employers are asked to list the qualities they seek and those that work for them, communication skills are invariably put first um, in the study. Um, however, employers rate recent, rate recent grads as underprepared and oftentimes deficient. Um, so if there's ways that we can help students um, uh, be better at communicating when they get to the workplace, I would like to help do that. Um, in a large study, employers reported that communication was the top skill they wished universities would emphasize more. Um, so in the literature, a lot of um, this type of writing is writing to learn as opposed to learning to write. So you could learn to write for your discipline. So like in math, we do this. Um, but writing to learn is sort of more we're emphasizing communication, but because like we want to achieve these other goals and learn the content. So the focus moves from finding the answer to analyzing and synthesizing information to provide an appropriate amount of justification to the intended audience. And when you kind of set those expectations, the mental activities associated with this type of writing, like reflection, consolidation, elaboration, interpretation, it requires the writer to think deeply about the content and why it's acceptable or valid. Um, and this has been shown to enhance learning um, when you ask students to, to, to write and to, to justify. So to kind of wrap up and summarize, um, how do I want students to experience my course? I want them to learn the content at a deep level while also having an enjoyable time or it's not a terrible time. And I attempt to do this by promoting active engagement in the class and outside and by creating assessments that hopefully students find meaningful and where they can showcase their creativity. I wanna reduce barriers that are at least in my control. Um, and I attempt to do this in some small ways by um, you know, designing my slides and my videos and my course to reduce cognitive load by um, helping students develop metacognitive skills and growth mindset, and by promoting a sense of belonging, both in my classroom, but also with our future uh, university students through the outreach work that I do. How do I want students to remember my course? I wanna help students develop habits of mind and skills that will stick with them and hopefully serve them well uh, in their degrees and their careers and, and their lives. And I attempt to help them develop skills such as perseverance, positive feelings about math, critical thinking, and communication skills. Um, so that's sort of um, my thoughts about this and how these questions have kind of shaped my teaching and inspired the outreach work I do, but I'll kind of throw it back to you to end and to leave you with this question to think about in your courses and your uh, context, how do you want students to experience and remember your courses? Thanks.